Now, Dr. Ranji, Happy New Year to you. Welcome back. Happy New Year, George. Lovely to speak to you. Now, tell me, um, I predicted here, I feel quite uh, pleased that I did, pleased that it has worked out the way uh, that it seems to be working out, namely uh, that the Omicron, based on the South African experience, would travel far uh, but would not kill or hospitalize anything like the number of people that previous, previous variants of the virus have done. So far, uh, that prediction has been vindicated, uh, at least on the face of it. Where do you stand on that? I think that assessment is entirely accurate, George. Um, in terms of traveling far, unquestionably, we've seen a spike, massive spike in positive tests. Um, if you look at the world figures, we had a single day on the 30th of December where we had 2 million people test positive. That was a, that was a first in, in the UK. Uh, on the 30th of, of December, we had 228,000 people test positive. So a huge spike that we've not seen before in terms of positive tests. But of course, the immune landscape, certainly in countries which have access to vaccination, is totally changed. And effectively, what we thought was very dangerous and incorrect at the beginning of the pandemic, which was this strategy of herd immunity, protect the economy, and if a few people die, old people die, so be it, i.e. let it run rampant through the population, uh, that was very damaging then. Um, but now, in as much as the oldest, most vulnerable portion of the population who experienced the lion's share, 85% of the mortality and morbidity uh, from coronavirus, have essentially been overwhelmingly protected by vaccination, or those people who haven't had vaccination, a very large percentage of them have had the coronavirus and were the less vulnerable. So actually, you're quite right. There have been far fewer uh, hospitalizations and far fewer deaths. Now, there are an increasing number of people in hospital with coronavirus now, as there would be if we think that more than two, two million people, one in 25 of the population, have a coronavirus. Of course, there are going to be some of those in hospital. But what we're seeing with myself and my colleagues, some of our wards uh, are in fact so affected that on the basis that we don't want it to spread, it's deeply affecting our work. But we're not seeing those patients, those vulnerable comorbid patients who were so vulnerable during the first and second waves, we're not seeing them succumb in the same way. Very many of them are testing positive and being asymptomatic. So that what was very, again, profoundly wrong, talking about everyone dying with coronavirus rather than of it at the beginning of the pandemic. Essentially, we're getting to that point now. By excess mortality, we don't seem to be in a period of excess mortality at the moment. If we look at the true global figure for the number of people who are likely to have died as a result of coronavirus during the last two years, it's hard to estimate those figures, but it's, you know, you're probably talking around 15 to 20 million people. So a very substantial number of people. Right now, we are not seeing excess mortality, George. That was my second question to you. What is the excess mortality? Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, happy to hear that it doesn't seem to uh, exist in the way that it did early in the pandemic when it was very clear that we were suffering uh, very much excess uh, mortality. That rules out for the lockdowns then, doesn't it? To my mind, yes. I thought, you know, I, I had a lot of respect for, for um, independent SAGE initially. It does seem to me that as, as uh, epidemiologists there, to an extent, I've become almost obsessed by the numbers and the fact that to stop coronavirus spreading, we should lock down. I think we're in a very different situation now. You know, China was the one, one of the few countries who su successfully implemented the zero COVID strategy, who really used testing to isolate people with coronavirus from the population and protect the overwhelming you know, mass of the population from getting coronavirus. We can't, we can't do that now. You know, if two, two million people in the country have coronavirus, everyone's, uh, the vast majority of people, people who want to be vaccinated have been vaccinated, then essentially we're at a stage where actually we must ask ourselves in the near future, what is the further utility of testing? At the moment, we're kind of using it to isolate people, but not very seriously. We're not really isolating um, uh, uh, the, the people from you know, two million of the population are not fully isolated. They're being off work for a little while, but they're continuing essentially uh, in many respects to have contact and the virus is continuing to circulate. We've reached that stage where it has become endemic. 
um, endemic but far less harmful. And whereas before I was absolutely against equating this to flu, now with the new landscape, at least a, a, 10, a 90 percent reduction in, in mortality. So it starts to approximate something much more like the flu. And, in, and over the over the you know coming months, I have no doubt that immediately after Christmas and the new year, we'll see even higher numbers. We will see problems with you know staff having to isolate because they've tested positive, though they're not necessarily sick. That affects the running of the NHS. Those are real problems. Workforce problems uh, are real. But in terms of this, the sickness and death, we have to ask ourselves, at what stage do we actually stop testing? Do we stop um, you know, uh, uh, restricting society at all because of the circulation of coronavirus? And I think that is the question which is going to dominate the next couple of months. Ultimately, I think not leading to lockdown, but rather leading to restriction of a uh, 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 lifting and restrictions. But that's slightly contradictory to some of the recent legislation, of course, that was passed uh, uh, by the government. Uh, uh, people unfortunate enough uh, to be watching and listening from Scotland and Wales uh, know, of course, that they have uh, governments, if you can call them governments, in place uh, that are determined to stick to the old script, uh, not least to be different from the script being followed in Whitehall and Westminster, but maybe that's for another day. Um, we're running out of testing equipment. Uh, as far as I know, right at this moment, it's practically impossible to get a test at the minute, so I'm not sure how much longer this regime of testing uh, everyone uh, will continue, not least because uh, when told to isolate, even if not sick, the kind of uh, problems in the labour market that are going to be caused uh, is going to be more harmful than, than uh, these people continuing their life as usual, don't you think? I do. I mean, the whole purpose of testing initially was to accurately, you know, find out exactly who had the virus and isolate them from the community. We, we, we totally failed to do that. I think, you know, the Scottish and Welsh legislature, you know, learnt the damaging effects of the delayed decision making when there was a no immunity essentially in the population and coronavirus was spreading like wildfire through the population, precisely the time when, you know, um, uh, herd immunity protecting the economy, I protecting the, the profits of the corporate elite was uppermost in the, in the minds of the Conservative Party. And, you know, I think that sooner or later, the Conservative administration, Boris Johnson, will play a price for that. And, you know, the, the, the fact that he flouted his own restrictions, all of the scandal around the party gate really just is indicative of their attitude that there's one rule for the herd, another rule for themselves, the ruling class and the extremely rich. So that, I think, will come back to bite Boris. I think the other um, legislatures are still thinking that they will get extra brownie points for acting early. But actually, the situation on the ground has totally changed. You can actually feel when, when people now have a positive diagnosis. They don't, they're not worried for their health. They're not, they're not worried for their loved one's health. They say, oh, I hope you're okay. But overwhelmingly, people are. The number of people who are in ITU is now very small. People are spending much less time in hospital if they're having to go to hospital with coronavirus. They're being discharged um, and, and recovering. So, you know, I think the situation's totally changed. We are coming out of the pandemic. The numbers we've had are, are probably far in excess of the recognised numbers, but that's largely due to the incredible wave that there was in South Asia, still largely uh, un unrecognised, probably as many as four million people, George, died in India alone. But that was then, this is now, the pandemic is two years down the line. We failed to isolate and control it because that wasn't the primary concern of our governments. But now having spread through the population and thankfully having found not one but many uh, vaccines, the main issue still remaining for you know, the end of, of, the, of the pandemic globally is to make sure that vaccination is actually distributed to those countries who need it most. And, and really the, the theme that we've seen coming to light throughout this period has been the dichotomy, the, 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 the different interests between a global corporate elite who want to put their profits first at all time, as epitomized by those who refuse to waive their property rights over the vaccination and refuse to, let, to, to give recognition um, to the first vaccines that were developed, the, the Sputnik vaccine, um, of course, the, the Chinese Sinovac vaccine, uh, and, and therefore have interfered, actually, with the global response. They haven't treated it primarily as a health problem. They've treated it as an economic and power problem. They've used, actually, you know, coronavirus and access to, to funds and access to vaccination to leverage their 
power and control of governments. And you think of uh, Venezuela, think of uh, Cuba. Cuba who were able to develop their own uh, vaccination, of course. But but this we've seen essentially the normal power politics play out through the spectrum of coronavirus. Uh, I think our own working people are heartily fed up of it. They're, they're fed up of the arrogant attitude of government. And they're desperate and they're crying out really for change. And, and I think that's epitomized, as you were talking about, by, by the changes in, in the polls that we're seeing. But I think you're right to say that essentially there's been no different thinking. There's been no different plan coming from the Labour government. There's certainly been no real protection of the NHS. We've seen a radical switch towards privatization of the NHS. That's been ratcheted up that the whole agenda throughout this pandemic. And the Labour government have chimed in with that despite raising their voice apparently against takeover of US health companies in a half-hearted way. There's no real different agenda. And really what this has shown is that, you know, above all, you know, Operation Cygnus back in 2016 predicted entirely the NHS would fall over, that we wouldn't be able to see our GPs, as you were saying, that we wouldn't have access to health services. And that is actually being used to further put pressure, these record waiting lists, unprecedented waiting lists, five, six, seven, expected to become 13 million people trying to access care. All of that's being used to lever people away from the NHS into the, into the corporate sector, into private health care. And actually the bed base, which has been so eroded, will remain eroded. There's no serious political agenda on either side of the house to change that, to reverse the direction to really institute a proper national health service that works for the people. It shouldn't be a question of, can we treat coronavirus or people's other sicknesses? We should have, be able to treat all the illness of all our people. There shouldn't be a dichotomy between the economy and the health of the people. You can't have one without the other. And, right, and this so. is what we desperately need, George. Well, now that uh, Blair is clearly back in charge of Labour politics, I guess it's back to the future uh, in any case for them leaving a lot of ground clear for those with a radically different point of view. Dr. Ranji, excellent prescription and prognosis for 2022. Thank you, as always, for joining us.